me, Shep. It's perhaps nine years since we met in Budapest. At a Niger U meeting, then you were part of the family, as it were, geographers. You've been doing many interesting things since then. And I think it would be very interesting for our students and colleagues to hear about a geographer who's actually out there in the action doing new things. So if you would, tell me about your life, your background, your career. Okay. Um, as you said, I'm a geographer from Amsterdam University, where I got my training in the 50s, with a special interest in agricultural developments and restructuration of agricultural institutions and property and production methods. Because of that I did my master's degree work in southern Italy in the Metro Journal where they were changing a, a church latifundium in partly private properties and partly an agricultural cooperative. After that I went to Poland for two years to do my PhD research on collective farming in Poland, the ways it was handled since 1944 till 1960. And I got my degree in the beginning of the 60s in Amsterdam also. Mm -hmm. And then I went with several other geographers into inner city urban studies, inner city and urban core studies. Mongam was Peter Hall and Hagerstrand from Lund and Mackensen from Berlin and Shimemi in Rome and several others. We did that for several years, and as is normal, I think, in the scientific world, it finished up with a, with a book. Mm -hmm. so Europe 2000. No, no, that was another book. Mm -hmm. That was the next step. Uh -huh. This was a book on inner core and inner cities and urban cores in, in West European and North American cities, how they develop, how they are restructured, uh, the influences they undergo by the whole society and the ways they influence society as well. But Michelle, may I interrupt you? I'd like you to go back on that schooling period, that university yeah. period, and sort of uh, tell us what was most helpful, who were the people that influenced you and helped you most in your own educational experience? Can you? Now, if maybe I should start not with people, because there was a, quite a lot of change in people, because during my studies, uh, several chairs changed their ordinarius, so. I think what was most important, if I compare it to the present day situation, is that our field of studies was so enormous wide that I still profit from it. Say I got physical geography, I did geology, I had to do um, all kinds of morphology, I had to do on the other side sociology, ethnology, ethnography, I had to do geography of Europe, of the world, of the Netherlands and so on. And so at that time our university training was extremely wide did not go, of course, very deep because it was impossible. But if I compare it to present day colleagues who are finishing their studies, who were just finished, say, 20 years later than I did, then I see that they are specializing already from the first year of their studies. And I think that's not helpful for a career later on. Probably it will, it will limit the possibilities for careers into far smaller sections of society. And in that whole setting, of course, it's clear I had a whole lot of professors who I had to go to or who, in whom I was interested. And I think ultimately for the work I'm doing now, the ethnology and the physical geography side is of more importance than the geography, social geography side, which we had in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. But that's because of peculiar reasons in, in Mali itself where mm -hmm. I'm working now. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's very interesting for us to hear about because, you see, Dutch geography is uh, not very well known in the Anglo world, even though you have good journals and everything, but this breadth versus depth issue is something that is bothering us a great deal in graduate schools at the moment. You're saying that in, in Dutch education during the 50s there was this emphasis on breadth and uh, an emphasis also on problem relevance, you think. Yes, well that was a fine background from which to move into yes. the urban core. So now we're in the 60s and you're involved in urban work? In urban work. Yes. Now from the university on I went into one of our new territories, which is uh, the, let's say the inland sea, the IJsselmeer, which is a central sea in the Netherlands, in the middle of the Netherlands, where since about 40 years the Dutch people is reclaiming new lands. And I was charged uh, during five years with the all social economic research, in particular for preparing the building of new towns, which uh, 
I did from say about 65 till 68 in the preparation phase for the future capital of the region, which where we started building 67. I moved in in the beginning of 68. I'm still living there. <coughs> We're still having a house there. And at the moment, the town is over 40,000, and we are heading for 100,000 within 15 or 20 years. That's quite exceptional too that a planner will live in the place he plans. Yes, yes, it was <laughs> exceptional at that time too. Most architects and most planners they like to live in in the countryside, in nice uh, farmers' cottages, and which they restructure and construct. And uh, mm -hmm. no, I, I wanted specifically because I think I was the head of the social economic department. I wanted to live in the town in order to live with the people, the problems of a new community where people is getting together from all sides of the country with a lot of problems because most people who migrate, they have also a certain interest to leave their former area, which very often means there has been some problem, hidden or not, but they look for a new future and a new environment and, and all those people putting together creates quite a lot of problems. And, uh, also another point I think in our population was that what we call them, they all had a certain character of pioneers. Every one of them wanted to do something. And if you put together people who want to do something, you create too much energy. And this creates, again, problems. But all these type of problems we are with, <coughs> and we enjoyed it very much. It's, uh, I must say, it's a unique experience, because, say, most new towns in the world, they always begin with an existing village, an existing small town. Here we began right from the beginning, just on sand, and uh, we had to build up uh, the, the whole plan and the whole town from, from nothing. Mm. Uh, but, uh, and it continues. But, um, oh, it continues. It continues it's uh, very successful, and uh, we have a very special traffic system developed in the town, which, for instance, makes it practically impossible to have accidents between pedestrians and cars. Mm -hmm. So we have no children dying in traffic since 15 years. There's no child dying all the 15 years of its existence. So yeah. that's, I think, that's wonderful for people to know. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons people get to the town in order to be sure of, say, a kind of personal security. Mm -hmm. Now, from there on, I went into politics. I became, more or less by accident, uh, elected for our Senate. And later on, I moved into the House in 72. What year were you senator? Six. I was in 70. I became senator until uh, 72. In 72, I was elected in the House of Representatives. And six months later, I moved on into the cabinet, uh, say, left-center cabinet, the first one since 58 in Holland, and the last one up till now. And I got the post of Secretary of State for uh, Transport. Mm -hmm. uh, Can you describe the ideology of that, of that party that comes in for just that short yeah, time? Yeah, yeah. The party is a very new party. We started in 68. It uh, was a split off at the beginning of some Christian parties, which are rather big in Holland and rather important, but in the center of the political system, which means they don't take stands because they always have to balance between left and right. And some members of those parties, and I was among them, disagreed with that. We wanted to make a choice. We did it from, say, evangelical inspiration, as we called it at that time. I think at the moment we would give it another name. But uh, we tried at that time to say, uh, let's make uh, the Bible reality and let's behave as human beings should behave, which included in our views to be pacifists, which included to be environmentalists, which included to be uh, very much in favor of self-help, of self-organization, of self-structuring, of production, of help for third world countries and so on. And we made choices which were based on this ideology, choices which were rather radical and the name of the party is Radical Party. We represent only two to four percent of the voters in Holland. So our, say, our membership in Parliament is in the 150 members is between three and seven. But at certain moments, and that was the case in '73, we were just the party who could tip the government into the direction of left-centre. Uh, because of that reason, we got uh, two ministers in the cabinet and one Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. Of course, I tried to 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 realize our ideology in transportation politics, which included at that time uh, also the post office. I was postmaster general and uh, I did all the transportation, uh, transport of goods uh, policies in Europe and in Holland, as far as we are involved. International shipping and also meteorology was in my field, which linked me back to my training in former days. I was, I think, the first secretary who had the 
meteorology section uh, who had a certain training in that field. But the moment you start realizing your ideals, you find that uh, you are living in the reality of a Dutch nation, of a European society, which Holland is a part. And you find out that uh, it slows down. You still have your goals, but you have to find ways, you have to select means in order to reach your goals. Yes. At certain places you cannot reach your goals because of absolute barriers, mm -hmm. or by economy, or by social sure. effects. But in that transport context, you had a plan, didn't you, for, for free public transport? Yes, that's right. Now, that's a very exciting idea, and even if it didn't succeed, could you talk a little bit more about that? What would justify a complete... You know, it's very difficult if you have... I've been working on that subject for about 10 or 15 years before I published, and I think the more you are involved and the more you know of a subject, the more difficult it is to, to, to grasp it in three minutes. Mm, yes. But... Uh, I think there are several possibilities of closing in to this subject. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, in fact, public transport is already free for a great deal. In most states, state or national governments or city governments pay most of the costs of public transport. So let's say the quality decision has been taken already. It's only a decision on quantity. How much money are you willing to spend from public funds mm -hmm. on public transport? And the second approach is that we are spending so enormous public funds on private traffic, which is accessible only for a certain layer of society, mostly a layer who is male, mm -hmm. who is comparatively rich, who is comparatively mobile, mm -hmm. um, excluding women, excluding old age people, excluding children. Mm -hmm. We are spending so much money on the private sector that it is quite understandable to say, let's tip off the balance and go with this money to the public uh, transport. Mm -hmm. And when you look around now in Europe, you see everywhere cities are turning towards public transport and leaving the private sector. Mm -hmm. And of course, Saudi Arabia has helped us quite a lot, but uh, in this way, <laughs> was not expected in the 1970s, I must say, but it, it helps turning the tide. And, uh, and I think the ultimate result will be uh, some form of free public transport. Mm -hmm. And in my study, I included several case studies from Europe where towns were working on it and uh, where experience were uh, going on and I think that helped quite a lot in the thinking. Mm. So then, uh, apart from that, you, the rest of your political preoccupations, you a large amount in the ones you've already mentioned, but what other major dreams were involved in that political platform of yours that you had a chance of expressing while in office? Oh, you know, I think the most important thing is that uh, we try to realize, one of our ministers was the Minister of Culture and the other one was the Minister of Science, Science and Technology, that all three of us in the cabinet and in the whole presentation tried uh, to develop the whole idea of self-determination, that people on a decentralized level as close as possible to the bottom of society can make their own decisions and can govern and structure their lives. Um, I think that was the underlying Ideal. proposition we had to make because, for instance, pacifism is well to defend, mm. but if your country is a member of NATO, mm. where well, you cannot leave at all of a sudden, and our party is a very small one, so it has no power in, in parliament to push through uh, certain decisions, then you can show off your pacifism. Mm. And in the economic reality, there are also a lot of problems where you cannot realize things against multinationals, against, say, European community, mm -hmm. uh, economic market, uh, common market, uh, against links which are between countries. So the field where we could really do something was bringing decisions to people, and there I think we spent a lot of time and a lot of work on it. And this goes out in so many details. That sure, this, yes, uh, but we get a flavor of that yeah. period in your life. Then you. After that, political... Now, in 77, we lost the election, so I must say the other side of parliament got two seats more than our side, so, you know, and then it's normal in democracy. I think the government shifts uh, right center, mm. and I had a seat in parliament, at least I was elected, but uh, at that moment, in that position, I thought it was better to turn to practical work than yes. to return to parliament. I was influenced, I think, by the fact that I had been let's say, in power for four years and a half. Mm -hmm. And that it was very difficult to leave the power to others and only to discuss power. And, uh, yes, can you I dwell was, a bit on that? No, I don't think, I think there is a certain attitude necessary
to be a discussant of power, to, to look at others and to give command, knowing that your commands are not helping a thing for making other decisions. That's more or less the position of any opposition anywhere in a democracy, that you may talk to the president and to the other side. And mm -hmm. you know, even if your ideas are good, you have to wait till the moment that someone from the other side picks up the idea yes. and is, is developing it himself or herself. Now, after I've been doing the practical work for four years and a half, taking decisions, helping people to reach certain goals, looking for certain budgeting mm -hmm. realizations, then it is very difficult to return to a place where you are just discussing. Yes. So when I looked at that possibility of that situation, I decided uh, to leave and uh, to follow one of the other lines in our party thinking. My wife is also a member of our party. and She has been a local councillor and uh, an older man our town right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So she's very much involved in the whole thinking as well. Mm -hmm. We decided to follow one of the other lines of our party and to go into development aid, to, to have some experience from the field ourselves, to see whether our theories about the ways the third world should be helped mm -hmm. uh, were practical, and whether our theories could be handled. So we left a few months, I left office in December 77 and we left for Mali in West Africa mm -hmm. in March uh, 78 mm -hmm. and there I took up a job in coordinating um, development work for non-governmental agencies in the northern part of Mali which is an area yes if you point it out on the map perhaps this is the whole country of Mali mm -hmm. and to the north is Algeria to the south is Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, to the west is Senegal, to the east is Niger and Tapa Volta. Mm -hmm. and the country is essentially two parts, it is Mali Sud, the thousand and a half, which is about the size of France with seven million inhabitants, mm -hmm. and the northern half, or the northern two thirds I would say, which is about the size of the Benelux plus West and East Germany plus Poland, with about 700,000 inhabitants, most of them nomads. And this is the area where I'm working. Um, a whole series of non-governmental agencies from nine different European countries, plus Canada, they pool their money mm -hmm. for work in the Sahel, and I represent all these organizations with their combined money. And we have interventions in a local program which is directed towards um, reorganizing the agricultural population into cooperatives. Uh -huh. The situation there is that, of course, there is a traditional structuration of the population in tribes, in ethnies, in families, mm -hmm. and so on. But because of all modern influences coming in from modern Western society, and because of the great draft of 68 till 73, this old society is, is, fragmented. is fragmented, and people are losing their contacts. The structure is, is, is going part and we are trying now to bring in another structure which is more let's say it's modern at least it comes from the outside but uh, it's more rational and not traditional and we try through this new structure which is a cooperative structure we try to bring in all types of uh, help uh, development aid to the population so officially we are backing up the cooperative movement, trying to expand the cooperative movement. In fact, for us, the cooperatives is only a medium for introducing all types of development aid. Mm -hmm. um, I can see that one of the aspects that would be attractive to you ideologically is that the cooperatives, in theory, should be organs for self-help. Oh, yes. The natives certainly. are taking the authorship of these yeah. various plans. And I'm, I'm, it's very helpful for me that I've been working in Poland on cooperatives because the, in the very early years in Mali, in between 1960-68, there was a rather East European-oriented government. So in the whole terminology in Mali, they took up the terminology of Eastern Europe, uh -huh. which makes it rather easy to work. And uh, because I know the terminology, uh -huh. uh, they are giving it a completely different contents at the moment, but the words are still there. And if you have worked in the East European context, you better understand what's happening. But the basic idea of self-government, of self-help, uh, is, is very important. And that's one of the reasons we took the job, because there were several possibilities. But I was very much interested by the cooperative idea living there. 
Now, what we do, in fact, on the spot is uh, helping people to or to start new cooperatives and when they have a cooperative to develop its functions. It means that if a village comes to the regional boards of cooperatives, which is situated in Gao, the two major cities are Gao and Tombuktu, the two different regions of the country. And when people in the Gao region want to start a cooperative, they go to the regional board in Gao, they present themselves that they, with their compromise, if they are nomads or their village, they want to start. Then um, the first requirement of the board is that some people in the village will be will be alphabetized. They have to learn reading, writing, and calculating. One woman must be ready to be a midwife, and one man must be ready to be prepared to be, in, let's say, a medical care, mm -hmm. lowest level assistant. But the language of that literacy isn't necessarily English, French, or Dutch. It is oh, no, no, it is not. Language. It is not. The official education in Mali is in French. The, yes. the formal primary and secondary school education is all in French. Our literacy program is in the local, in the vernacular language which is Tamashek with the nomad pastoralist and which is Songrai with most of the river people in the valley which are sedentary agriculturalists mm -hmm. and then you have fishermen with another language and there about six languages in the area where I work. Now what we do is if a village is ready to prepare some people for this education, for alphabetization and, uh, and health education, then they after that they can come back and then we start the small investment in say a consumer cooperative, that's always the beginning. So we may rule out all, all say, Lebanese type of uh, commerçants, mm -hmm. which means that people, instead of paying 100 or 200 uh, percent over the real price of a product, they can go down to 20 percent, because also we need a certain remuneration for the magazine, for the, for the magazinier, and so on. Now from there on, there is a, a wide development, there is health education, for the population of the cooperative. There is a further going alphabetization. There are developments in the direction of production. Mm -hmm. So we borrow their money for productive purposes, mm -hmm. for starting new uh, herds if necessary, mm -hmm. for buying motor pumps in small polders we are constructing with them in the mm -hmm. River Valley and all different types of other things. Now we are nearing the moment, and in several cooperatives we have passed the line already that the cooperatives are becoming productive cooperatives, yes. which in Marxist ideology is a higher form of cooperative, well, cooperative movement. In agrarian and terminology, they're the crucial ones to work. Yes, I know, I know, no, but I must say that the difference between lower grades and higher grades is something I think the Marxists like to talk about. For me, it's only a difference in function. But it is a very important phase if people start to do things collectively. Yes. And the beginning is with us always with the net profit the population makes with the magazine mm -hmm. because every magazine makes every shop where sure. the, the essential articles are sold like rice and salt and mm -hmm. tea and coffee, Nescafe mm -hmm. in most cases and sardines in, in, mm -hmm. in cans and milk powder. So some 10 articles is the basic thing in the shops. They make a net profit on it which is very small in most magazines. It is not more than say 500,000 francs Marien which is uh, 5,000 French francs, mm -hmm. which is, if I translate it into dollars, is, uh, how much would it be? That's two and a half, so it's just, yeah, between 1,000, 1,500 American dollars for a full year net profit, so that's practically nothing. But the decisive thing is that the Assemblée Générale, the, the General Council of the Cooperative, has to decide about the use of this money. And mostly, right from the beginning, they decide to use it for a collective purpose for amelioration of a school building or for building a dispensary or mm -hmm. for using some improving of a road or something like that, which means it's also collective mm -hmm. property. Yeah. Now in that way we go further, we have now several, we assist several uh, cooperative of uh, nomads, of pastoralists who have started collective herds mm -hmm. for improvement of the herds of the members. So it means that in the collective herds they buy better animals, and from time to time, members have a chance to change a uh, worse animal for a better animal, so that all the herds may be lifted up in quality. Of course, it's a very slow process, but probably it is much more effective than putting in, say, some uh, breeds from, from Holland or England sure. and to have them lifting too quickly. In the agricultural cooperatives, it's exactly the same movement. There is a movement 
towards collective uh, making of dikes, of small polders, buying collectively a motor pump. And, yes. and the polders are not very large, 50 hectares, say 100 acres, 150 acres. It's very small territories. But nevertheless, it's made by themselves, and we are assisting only with cement, with paying some of the material and so on. And, but most of the work comes from the people themselves. Can you comment on any distinction or any possible conflict between the sort of consumer-oriented co-ops and the production-oriented co-ops? It seems to me there's a, a fundamental distinction between those two types of cooperatives in Northern Europe, anyway. Yeah. Uh, you have slid over any such yeah. distinction. No, I think, of course, there's a very large distinction between the two, because a consumer cooperative always is a cooperative in which people is owner of its own money mm -hmm. and they use say the magazine the shop only as a, a point of depart for for buying and selling things mm -hmm. but it has nothing to do with the money and say the economic power of the rest of the cooperative yes. as soon as you start to begin productive cooperatives mm -hmm. you are integrating work you are integrating capital you are integrating profits mm -hmm. and that's a very important development mm -hmm. But I don't see an opposition, at least not in our region, between the two. It's more a development from the mm -hmm. consumer organization into the productive cooperative. Mm -hmm. And the, the motive behind this development or the, 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 the factor which is, mm -hmm. is, is pushing them into the productive cooperatives mm -hmm. mostly is the net profit of the shop. They have to do something with the money. And they have to decide whether they are paying out to everybody 500 francs mm -hmm. or are we going the 500,000 to use for a common purpose. Now, the moment of that decision is a very important decision. What we find out also as a very important development is that, say, when a cooperative starts, and mostly in the nomadic area, this phenomenon is, is, is a fact, then the first president is the former feudal chief yes. of the family, of the ethne, of the tribe. And his committee, his board, mostly also are, say, former noblemen. You know, probably know the Tamashic yeah. society is very much higher highs between noblemen and lower layers, mm -hmm. up till slaves. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the cooperative, everybody is alike, equal. equal, in theory. But to realize that in practice is, is a huge development. And now what we see in several of our cooperatives already is that after some years, uh, so many problems with the feudal chief, with the president. But every year there have to be formal uh, elections, and that at a certain moment there is a movement in the cooperative, and that the chief is ousted, and someone else is uh, elected uh, president, or some other members, for instance, Bellas, which are the former slaves, are entering the board, which is a development which mm. is uh, very remarkable. And I must say I did not expect it so quickly. Mm -hmm. It's going so quickly that I'm a bit amazed. Mm. But it, nevertheless, it means that the cooperative is really alive. Because yes. if you can get away from the feudal structure, mm -hmm. it means the change, which I said earlier, from traditional society into a more rational society is already far underway. But do you think that, that a new structure will emerge within this so-called rational setting, where some differentials of wealth, beginnings, beginning of course, wealth, will of course, emerge. It's very clear. Will you explain to me how the co-op works? Do individuals take out shares in the, in the cooperative? Uh, do they come in owning some amount, each of them, and then collectively decide? Or is it the other way around? I think there's a big no, difference in no. no, that would be, I think, the next phase, what you're saying now, because we begin with the consumer cooperative, the earnings of that cooperative are used for collective purposes, mm -hmm. but still all members have their own herds, their yes. own fields, do their own work, yes. but they start already to integrate work, because mm -hmm. if you have a collective herd, it means everybody must take his day or his week in sure. order to care for it, mm -hmm. so which means integration of work mm -hmm. in the agricultural cooperatives, exactly the same with the collective farmland where mm -hmm. all people together have to do some work someday. Now the next step, of course, will be, if this is successful, that at a certain moment, some people will start combining their herds, combining their lands, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And then maybe after that, there is a moment that the cooperative is going to decide that all members will participate in the collective forming of formation of, of collective capital. But that is, is, still, is still a way. Okay. The collective capital is still the result, the net result of the, the, the work in the... Yeah 
property for okay. developments. Okay. Do you anticipate differences between what would be appropriate cooperative structure for a nomadic or former nomadic people with herds and the, the sedentary folk? Do you see any possible distinctions in cooperative structure that will emerge in those two settings? Oh, I think so, yes. yes. I must even say at the moment that 36 cooperatives we are helping with money and with loans and so on. And practically every cooperative is different from the other one. Mm -hmm. the, the way they select their boards, uh, the way they collaborate, the, even the four collective herds existing at this moment, they are all formed in a different way. Mm -hmm. And also with different cattle in it, and one cooperative decides in a different way from the other. And, and we don't influence it, we just let it go and see what's happening. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's the best approach at the moment, that we are not, say, not we, nor the government agency in charge of cooperatives. We are not trying to force them in a certain direction because we think it's good. We just let it go and grow and, and, and we'll see what, what's happening. Yes, but Michel, now to go back to the fundamental ideological question of making people more self-reliant, mm -hmm. self-sufficient and so on. Most of the motor behind, the energy behind this movement comes from capital, from abroad and some expertise on hand to channel that in various ways. You anticipate a withdrawal of that eventually, of course. No oh, use. Yes. yes. But how do you feel about taking that role of mediator between the kind of conscience-stricken West wealthy and the development area? See, in Holland it was different. You were in the same no. country. You were still a mediator. But, but now you are in a peculiar situation. Where, no. No, how do you deal with that? No, that's very difficult. Uh, I must say, from the very first moment we went to Africa, and that was a bit the help I had for my ethnology training, we put in our heads that uh, our interference would be a foreign interference, would be alien to the local society, and <coughs> we had to be very careful in all our doings, in all our sayings. Mm -hmm. And still I have that attitude in northern half of Mali. I'm very careful, and uh, because also, it's a very proud people. They have a long-standing history of, of uh, empires, Mali yeah. empires, yeah. far back into history. Things which were unknown to me, say, before 77, but, but which are becoming alive. And people talk about it. It's really alive for them that they have a very long-standing yeah. history, in particular among the Tamashek. Colonialism has practically not touched Mali because it was so far away from the sea that, say, West European colonialists were not very much interested, which also gave them another character than, say, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, yes. Nigeria. Now, in that setting, we are bringing in certain ideas, and of course we know that part of the ideas is accepted by the fact that we come with money, we can help. And I realize that that is, a, in a way, a powerful position. But, um, I think you have to gain a certain respect, a certain trust in such an area. I'm sure the first half year, the first year, everybody looked at me. Of course I could do what I had to do, but mm -hmm. nobody really trusted me and uh, they were just looking at my acts, at my way of financing, at my acceptance of certain proposals and non-acceptance of others. And, but I think after that year, and just before I left now Mali, it was openly said to me that uh, I. They were following me, whatever I would say. Mm -hmm. I think it's the other extreme. Mm -hmm. So I gained, at least with the authorities, the presidents of the cooperatives and the, the, the national and regional uh, functionaries, I gained so much trust that they are now following me, say, blindly at certain mm -hmm. points. And I think that's not good either. And I told them that uh, that's not the way I want to continue. Mm -hmm. We had a large meeting in Gao in the beginning of June this year, 1981, 1980 where we discussed with all the boards of the cooperatives, so that was a meeting about 200, 250 people, the way we had been working in the past two years mm -hmm. and the way they want the work to be continued in the next year. Mm -hmm. This discussion was on cadre, was... Uh, framed. Uh, hmm? Framed? Was framed, yes. In our work, we have a certain five-year plan <coughs> in that area for our spending and for their functioning. And, of course, we have had now one year of experience with that plan, and they have had that experience. And we had a very frank discussion on this. 
which in itself is a great result. You know, there are nomads who five years ago were not able to sit down for 15 minutes. And now they were sitting for a full week talking and listening to each other. And maybe the listening is still more difficult than the talking. Yeah. And uh, it was a very good uh, meeting. And they were speaking openly to everybody, also to the governor who was there. And uh, just saying also where they had complaints against the government. They were very open, very frank which in a, land, in a country like uh, Mali, nevertheless, is a, is a bit a strange phenomenon. Mm. But to return to your question, we now realize we, are, we have power. And now my problem is that you have to use that power in the right way. So one of the ways I can use it, or two of the ways, which are the most important ones, are I think that I can be a mediator between the regional level of decision say, the presidents of the cooperatives and the regional functionaires, mm -hmm. and the national level in Bamako. Mm -hmm. Gao is 1,200 kilometers away from Bamako. And if you look at the map, this is Gao. Yeah. And Bamako, the capital city, is here. That's 1,200 kilometers. That's three days in Land Rover, over very bad roads, or piste, or just crossing through the desert. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult. Um, so the central government is not very much interested in what is happening in Gao. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, certain decisions of the regional level have to get their really approval good. in the national city. Now, that's part of my work, to, to transfer policy from local to national level, which for Mali is a strange thing, for normally mm -hmm. the transfer is from national level to local level, and this is just the reverse. Yeah. And the second possibility I have, and I use that also because of my past, is that I try to link up work in Gao directly into Europe, say yes. financing, organizational work, uh, training of people. Mm -hmm. um, I have by accident more access to, say, decision makers, powerful men and women in Europe, yeah. uh, to help this particular region. Yes. And of course, there are many regions in the world in need of help, and this region may profit a little bit of my presence. Now, this type of power, I think, I need to yes. their profit, and uh, I have to do it. And you trust in the group, the, the, this federation of non-governmental agencies with whom you work. Oh, that more or less, not... I would say. Yes. More or less. You know, but this is the regular thing, I think, that people in the field always are in opposition towards their central bureaucracies. Yes. That's true for most volunteers working in volunteer agencies. Yes. It's true for, for practically everybody who is working in the field mm -hmm. that they, at a certain moment, have a feeling that the central point headquarters is not understanding you and you are fighting decisions. Now I'm having exactly the same type of problems. I think you have to be a bit related on that. You have. How do you, how, I think that is a very big problem. It's a communications problem, a yeah. feedback problem. Is there a way you can imagine in the future doing the same thing between Gao and your North European sponsors as you are doing between Gao and Bamako? You sounded happier about yeah, what yeah. you were doing internally than you, what you're doing internationally. Yeah. You... No, our experience is that our problems in communication, in thinking, developing of the thinking mm -hmm. on development in Mali, in particular in Northern Half, is uh, better understood and better treated in Mali itself than in our relation with the sponsors. Mm. Um, I don't know whether you can change the sponsors enough because there are so many European interests involved, even with non-governmental agencies. Mm -hmm. There are beliefs in, say, that uh, development aid should not have too much technology mm -hmm. uh, to make it a bit uh, overcharged. But if I ask for a Land Rover, I'm practically sure I don't get it. If I ask for the money to buy 10 camels, I get it. Mm. And 10 camels is the same price as one land over. Mm. And then I start saying, why are we, from what European concept, are we refusing the land over and allowing the, camels. the camels? Yes. <laughs> now, these type of differences very often happen. And I think it's my task also to find that, yeah. to give arguments why things should be done or yeah. should not be done. But, but it is awful difficult to, to influence uh, Europeans. I've had a row, for instance, with one of our member agencies who is in charge of refugee assistance. Mm -hmm. And at a certain moment in Gao, there is a small group of women, 60 women, refugees left over from the 73 draft. Mm -hmm. From the large camps which were existing at that time of tens of thousands of people, there is a small group of 60 women with 200 children left over. Mm -hmm. Of course, without any energy, without any initiative, without any idea about their future, because everybody with a little bit of energy has left. Mm. Those 60 is really the rest. Yes. And I tried out with social services in Gao, a 
to, to find a program and we needed some financing. So I went to our member in charge of refugees and I told them the program. I said, money please. And I got uh, also contact with the Peace Corps to have a volunteer to do the work. The volunteer is on the spot. The money did never arrive. And the reason for that is that the Refugee Council said, these are not refugees because they never cost the national function. And then I said, can those people help it that frontiers recreated after the colonial period? That they forgot to cross the frontier. That's, you know, they, they are refugees over a distance of 700 to 1,000 kilometers away from their original territory. But they do not fit into our definitions of refugee. If you did not cross the frontier, you are not a refugee, so you are out. And, you know, and then at those moments, you get angry. I wrote a very angry letter to you. <laughs> <laughs> which of course was reproached afterwards from, Vlad, from our secretariat because I should not have done it, etc. And I said, of course I shouldn't have done it, but yes, if you're living there, course. you don't accept this type of European criteria. Yes, yes. Michelle, I'm curious about the, the long-term developmental policy. Uh, if you continue on the present uh, track, uh, you may lead Mali to a situation where, in fact, it is linked with a whole set of external economies and economic dependencies. Uh, is this a good policy or not? I mean, if it follows blindly the Western model with Western help, is it going to be worse off when you pull out? Now, at least I myself, I'm not leading Mali nor no. Mosra Mali onto a way of interlinking with the world economy. In my personal view, that should not be done. Mm. But local authorities, regional authorities in Gao, Tombuktu, they want to be economically a real part of Mali. And Mali, as a national unity, wants to be part of world economy. That's the normal trend in, in all developing countries. Personally, I don't think it's a good policy, but I'm not there to decide about Malian policy. That's their mm. task. I can only give advice and wait and see and look and mm -hmm. talk about it and help influence decision makers. Mm -hmm. In our policy in the plan, the five-year plan for the cooperatives, we attach far more money to self-sufficiency Mm -hmm. then to parts of the project which are directed towards linking up small handicrafts industry or agricultural products mm -hmm. into world society. But nevertheless, that is in development, that is going on. There are contracts made between Mali and other countries, for instance, for delivery of, of heads of cattle to mm -hmm. Libya, for delivery of certain uh, agricultural mm -hmm. products to, to West European mm -hmm. countries. And if that happens with the local population, and if they need help, then we help them, because it's their life, and mm -hmm. they have to be integrated into their national uh, politics, policy. Mm -hmm. um, I think, ultimately, that uh, all talking about interdependency between rich and poor world mm -hmm. is a way of saying that we want to be the independent, and the other ones have to remain the dependent. Mm -hmm. Because all the interdependency is and mm -hmm. remains, I think, that they have to give primary products yes. and we give the knowledge, we have the science, mm -hmm. we, we reproduce uh, mm -hmm. the better articles and so on. Mm -hmm. Now certainly at a certain moment, when these countries get more powerful, then they can stand up and mm -hmm. change this situation. But I'm afraid they never get so powerful that they can really stand up against the rich world and, and put up uh, their decisions. In fact, of course, the petrol countries, the younger sure. countries have done it, but they were in a very peculiar, very particular situation. Mm -hmm. But if you are producing, like Mali, cotton and peanuts, you know, you can say, we don't give peanuts any longer to the world. Mm -hmm. Now, all right, the mm -hmm. world will not eat peanuts, at least not Malian peanuts, but there are enough peanuts from Senegal, there are enough peanuts from the United States, so yes. the world is not waiting for the peanuts from Mali. So there is no force behind it. Right. And if they are not selling cattle, you know, you can get enough cattle in South America or Australia or the United States itself. So the Mali cattle is not important, it's mm -hmm. not powerful. Yes. This means that these type of countries, they are very weak and I'm afraid they will remain weak if they look into an interdependency system. So I think a self-sufficient system is far more important for them. And in our plan, there is a structural shortage of cereals in the north of Mali of about 16,000 tons per year. And in our plan, we have a lot of elements trying to eliminate that situation. Mm -hmm. So if we could get so far that, say, in 10 years' time, there is no structural deficit of 16,000 tons of cereals, mm -hmm. for the population in that area, it's a very great, uh, uh, great result. Yes, yes, and yes. if we can get so far, 
maybe afterwards you can say maybe we can produce more exporting of rice, exporting of other cereals, but that seems to be looked after later on, I think. Yeah, yeah. It seems to me that people are learning a great deal by creating these cooperatives, learning a great deal not only about how to do it, but what is the optimal structure in which development should happen. Is there a way you think that could diffuse from the lower echelons to the national level? With a cooperative ideology of development, you, you do not necessarily lead to international dependencies. Yeah. You become more self-sufficient. Do you anticipate that kind of development? Now, cooperatives have a very peculiar uh, limit. That is that the more they are successful, the more they are dangerous for yes. existing power structures. Mm. I think that our work with the cooperative in North Mali is more or less successful because we are so far away from a capital city, because central government and all elements in the power structure are not very much interested by the development of a new power structure which is a thousand kilometers away. This will not hinder their power structure. Now the strange thing of course is that if these cooperatives get to become powerful, get to have collective money, get to have money in the bank, can do their own commercializing, can mm -hmm. make their own power structures, then at a certain moment this equilibrium changes into a disequilibrium. And at that moment probably there are counter forces against the cooperatives. That's one problem. The second problem of the cooperatives I think is inside the cooperative. If a cooperative wants to be successful, it cannot use members who are not good enough for the cooperative. So it means a good cooperative, successful cooperative, is tending to eliminate yes. the worst members. And in our philosophy, a cooperative should be embracing everybody who wants to be a member. Yes. And in particular, the, the poorest ones and the weakest ones should have a possibility to enter. Now I think this also, in the beginning, is no problem. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the village agrees, of course, everybody should participate. Mm -hmm. But after a certain number of years, they see there is collective money, there is a school, there is a dispensary, there is a shop, there is a collective herd, and there is some people who is not working, not really doing, uh, yes. and, and, and then they try to eliminate those elements. And I think this is an inside problem of cooperatives yes. everywhere. It was in Poland exactly the same as in Mali, and I guess in Ireland or America. Or, so these two problems, both are endangering the cooperative movement, and I don't know which danger is the bigger one the local one or the national one. But in particular, of course, in countries which have a more or less dictatorial uh, structure, like Mali, officially it is a parliament, there is a parliament elected, there is a president elected, but in fact it is a one-party system. Mm -hmm. And the president is the former occupant of the seat in 68. Mm -hmm. He was brought in by a military putsch. Mm -hmm. So in fact, it is a continuation of a military government. These types of governments, of course, are not very much in favor by definition of cooperative movements because they are living in a military structure mm -hmm. and military by definition don't like other structures who may be powerful. Right, right, yes. But there's a question that I know many people will be asking, people who have been involved in cooperative work in Northern Europe and maybe America too. In what way can we help? Is there any way in which the experience of Northern Europe or America or Poland can be communicated to these people who are in the process of creating their own structures uh, in a way that isn't patronizing, in a way that's designed to be helpful. Uh, do you think that's possible at all? Oh, certainly it's possible. Uh, but first of all, we are not working from a North European base. We also have members in Italy and Spain, for instance. Mm -hmm. And that's very important because Northern Europe has a great handicap with French West Africa because people speaking French is very rare. So all links to Sweden, to England, Ireland, North America are, are a bit frustrated by this. Those countries are more oriented towards East Africa. But as far as French is still a usable language in Northern Europe, and in particular in France, Spain and Italy, um, we have, first of all, a different type of cooperatives in Southern Europe, mm -hmm. much closer still to the situation existing now in Mali, mm -hmm. which could also help to bridge the gap of information. It's much closer to their situation, much poorer, yes. much less developed. Mm -hmm. And this probably would be a good help for them. What I'm looking for is, is help in the sense that what we need is not money. I have enough money. My, my, the five-year plan is covered completely mm -hmm. by the agencies. But what we need is training of the cadre. So it would be very good if a president of a cooperative once could go a month to a cooperative somewhere uh -huh. 
and that you could, <coughs> could just look around, maybe even work with the people in a cooperative and see how it is done. A treasurer would be very good if he sees what it really means to have bookkeeping, because their bookkeeping is still that all debts are left and all credits are right, and you know, it, it's, it's, it's very weak. Um, it would be good for teachers to see what cooperative teaching means in, say, our settings, and they certainly could profit from this. Um, a second possibility, I think, is that linking up a, collect a cooperative movement in Gao and Tombuktu areas is also a kind of defense mm -hmm. against central government. Yes. You know, if at a certain moment, and maybe that moment never comes, but mm -hmm. if at a certain moment central government would refuse the cooperative movement or would mm -hmm. try to push it backwards, if it is linked up with yes. other cooperative movements internationally, uh -huh. this will be far more difficult for any central government. Uh -huh. And also in that way, I think, is just having contacts is a kind of, of protective Guarantee. cover. Uh -huh. And yes. that is, I think, very important. Well, that's very, very helpful. I think we have perhaps used up our time, and I think you've helped us see how we can best um, think about that issue. We who are in geography and research and in teaching, we often feel very frustrated about not being in on the action. But what you're saying to us, I think, is open your doors if you've got courses that might be helpful, or you can establish contacts for people from Mali to spend some time and look at what's happening and let them go back. And meanwhile, on the political level, those who are interested in that, uh, to try to bring a kind of structural uh, federation of cooperative activity, which will guarantee the weak one in case of, of political difficulty. Well, Michelle, we, I wish you the, all the very best in the completion of your work in Mali, the continuation of it. And um, thank you very much for sharing okay, what you did. You.